Okay, so today, today we're going to start by classifying abelian C star algebra. So this is a nice thing. So abelian C star algebra. Uh, so we already know an example of abelian C star algebras. Uh, very nice class of examples, mainly if X is a topological space. So then we can look at the continuous bounded functions on X, and this is a C star algebra with the pointwise operations and the supreme sup norm. So this is an abelian C star algebra. And then it turns out, which we'll show today, that in fact every abelian C star algebra is of this form. And not only that, but uh, even just taking X compact Hausdorff already gives us uh, every abelian C star algebra. Uh, so there's some redundancy. Uh, we get multiple C star algebras in this in this setting, um, and in fact, the compact Hausdorff spaces are also remembered by the abelian C star algebra. So abelian C star algebras are in bijective correspondence with compact Hausdorff spaces, uh, unital abelian C star algebras. Uh, we'll discuss the non-unital case uh, next week. All right. So to motivate this, uh, let's also introduce the notion of a spectrum for an abelian C star algebra. So this was uh, the, an example. Uh, so now if A is an abelian C star algebra, so then we'll define the spectrum of A is, again, denoted sigma of A. And this is defined to be the set of uh, homomorphisms from A to the complex numbers. And these are continuous uh, star homomorphisms. Uh, oh, this is just a Bonnach, even just a Bonnach algebra, an abelian Bonnach algebra. So these are continuous homomorphisms uh, into the complex numbers, and we'll want them to be non-zero non zero. So the zero homomorphism is not an element of this. Uh, now, um, so this. If you're a homomorphism, you're already continuous. Uh, if you're a homomorphism, you're already continuous. That's exactly right. In fact, uh, we have the, um, uh, if we have a homomorphism and we apply it to an element in X, and we want to know the absolute value of this, uh, then, uh, let's see, it's, uh, well, the way to see it's uh, continuous is to note so note if we have something which is um, uh, in the kernel of one of these homomorphisms, then it can't be invertible. That's the observation. Right? So note that if uh, x is in the kernel, of some homomorphism, so then we have that x is not an invertible element of our uh, Banach algebra. So I, I guess uh, this is in the unital case. So if if A is unital, so this definition you don't require unital, uh, but let's assume that A is unital. In which case we know that anything in the kernel cannot be uh, invertible. Why is that? Because if it were, since we have that chi of x times x inverse, homomorphisms preserve uh, the inversion. So this is one where, uh, oh, I guess we need to argue why is a non-zero homomorphism. Well, clearly it takes one to an item potent in the complex number. So uh, it must take the identity to one. And then, uh, so we get one is equal to this which is then equal to chi of x and then chi uh, of x inverse. So we see that uh, definitely is not in the kernel if this is the case. Right? So what does this mean? This means that therefore we have that for any element chi of x, whatever, whatever its value it is, has to be in the spectrum of x. right? Because if it were uh, not in the spectrum of x, we well, I mean, because since x minus chi of x 
is in the kernel. Okay. All right. So if it were if we're in the resolvent, then that would be invertible. Uh, so chi always max any element to its spectrum. In particular, we have that therefore the absolute value of chi of x is less than or equal to the spectral radius of x, which we already know is less than or equal to the norm of x. All right. So homomorphisms and facts. So this is true for an arbitrary homomorphism uh, in chi a to the complex numbers a homomorphism. So an arbitrary homomorphism is actually already continuous. So this part right here was a redundancy in the definition, but that's okay. Um, the other uh, remark, uh, yeah, so this is also true even in the non-unital case that a homomorphism is, uh, is automatically continuous and bounded by the norm, but we'll push off the discussion for the non unital case later. So um, we'll only assume, we'll only be interested in unital, the unital situation at the moment. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, the other remark I want to make, so I'll talk about the terminology, why it's called the spectrum in just a moment, but maybe in order to do that, let me first do this proposition. So the proposition is that um, the mapping from the spectrum of A to the uh, um, kernel, so the, which takes an element chi and sends it to the kernel of chi. So is a bijection between uh, A, between the spectrum of A and the set of maximal ideals. And this is also the case, so here I'll always assume A, this is an abelian unital Bonac algebra. So for the rest of the, today's lecture, we'll always be dealing with unital uh, algebras. Uh, so this is a bijection between the spectrum, so the set of homomorphisms, uh, continuous homomorphisms are in bijective correspondence with the set of maximal ideals. So let's prove this. Um, so uh, first of all, it's easy to see that this mapping, which takes chi to its kernel, is uh, an injective mapping, certainly. If you have two uh, homomorphisms and they have the same kernel, then they're going to be, they both take the same value at one, so they're going to be the same function. Right? So this is clearly an injective mapping. Uh, what else can we see is this also maps into at least the space of maximal ideals. That's easy to see. So if chi is a continuous uh, unit at all homomorphisms we already saw always preserve the unit. Uh, so we have a, this continuous homomorphism. And let's look at, uh, uh, so let's suppose that the kernel of chi is contained in some i and ideal. So, we, and let's suppose that this is a strict inclusion. So we want to show that the ideal is the entirety of A. Uh, so what do we know? Well, we know that there, there exists some A which is an i, but which is not in the kernel of chi. Uh, but then what can we say? Well, we can say that, uh, so A minus chi of A is in the kernel of chi, and hence is also in the ideal. And we know that this here is not equal to zero. So now we have two things which are an I, so their difference has to be an I, so we get that therefore we get zero is not equal to chi of A, but this is also an I, and hence I contains an invertible element, and hence I is everything. So therefore, I is equal to A. All right, 
So, so therefore, this mapping that I've defined here does map into the space of maximal ideals. Uh, we already saw it was an injection, so the only thing left to show is that it's a surjection. So now let's suppose that I is um, in uh, A, a maximal ideal, and we want to show that this is the kernel of some homomorphism, some continuous homomorphism. Uh, and then the first observation here is that, well, since it's a sh strict ideal, it can't contain any invertible elements. So we know that I intersect the set of invertible elements is empty. Uh, but on the other hand, we know that the set of invertible elements is open. We proved that in the first lecture. So therefore, it follows that if we take the closure of I and we intersect the set of invertible elements, uh, then this is still empty. But the closure of I is contained between I and A, and it's not everything because it doesn't contain any invertible elements. So the only other conclusion is we get that therefore I is already equal to its own closure. So any maximal ideal is automatically closed. Uh, and this is good because now we have a closed ideal so we can quotient our space by this closed ideal and we get another Banach uh, algebra. So then we get A mod I is again a Banach algebra. Uh, so I'll let you guys verify the, that this is indeed a Banach algebra. Uh, this is an easy exercise to do, to see that it's a Banach space and that the product satisfies uh, this with the induced norm. Uh, but now we have a Banach algebra. What else do we know about this? Though this Banach algebra has no non-trivial ideals, because otherwise we would pull them back to get an ideal here. So we have that uh, the only ideals are the trivial zero one and the entire space and this. In particular, this means that if you take any non-zero element, then the ideal it generates uh, has to be everything. But that means that that element has to be invertible. Right? So we get therefore any non-zero uh, element of A mod I is invertible. And now we remember back to the gelfand mazur theorem, which says that if you have a Banach algebra such that every non-zero element is invertible, there's only one, exactly one of those, and that's the complex numbers. So we get that therefore, A mod I is isomorphic to the complex numbers. Well, so now we can see exactly what our homomorphism is. Our homomorphism is just the homomorphism which just goes uh, from A to A mod I, and then we have this isomorphism with the complex numbers. So this is our, the composition of this, this is our chi, and we see quite clearly that I is the kernel of this chi. So that finishes the proposition. All right, so, uh, so this, the spectrum of this algebra is, uh, is exactly the maximal ideal space of the algebra. It's the, they, they coincide. Uh, so one ni nice maybe consequence of this proposition uh, is now let's maybe do an example. And let's suppose that A is generated Uh, by some element x and, uh, and the unit. So A as a unital Banach algebra is generated by a single element. Well, let's suppose this is the case. So then what do we know? We already know we have this map which takes uh, some chi in the spectrum and sends it to its value at x, which we know is in the spectrum of x. We already saw that. And the nice thing is that since A generates this, this is an injective map. If you have two elements and you know exactly what to do on x, 
then since it's a homomorphism, you know exactly what it does on all polynomials, uh, and hence, and you already know what it does on one, so you know what it does everywhere. Right, so this is, is injective. Uh, moreover, what else do you know? Uh, you also know that this is a continuous map because what is the topology over here? Uh, the topology over here is the weak topology. I think I, if I didn't mention that, I should have, of course. This is not just a set, but this is a topological space. So this, this uh, has the weak star topology as a uh, subset of the dual space, right? Uh, and so this is, uh, it's easy to see also that this is compact in this topology. Uh, if you're a weak star limit of continuous homomorphisms, then you're again a homomorphism. And we already know by Banach glue that the unit ball here is compact. Uh, so it's a closed subspace of a compact space. Uh, so this is compact, uh, and here we have a map, so we, this is injective, and I now claim that it's continuous, but that's pretty clear because uh, what happens if you have some net over here? Well, that means that they converge along each element, so in particular, they converge when you plug in x. Right? So it's continuous, so this is injective, uh, continuous, but it's also surjective. Uh, why is that? That's because if you have some element lambda in the spectrum of x, well then you can consider the ideal generated by uh, say x minus lambda, take i to be the ideal generated by x minus lambda, and then take some maximal ideal uh, which contains that ideal, if it's not it'll be maximal already in fact, uh, but then we get some maximal ideal containing it, and we get some, uh, we get, therefore, by the previous proposition, there's some uh, continuous homomorphism such that this is the kernel of this ideal. Right? So we get that, therefore, there exists a continuous uh, homomorphism, uh, chi, uh, such that uh, um, chi at x is equal to lambda, because x minus lambda is in the ideal. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that uh, this map is also surjective. So now let's see, we have a bijective continuous map between compact Hausdorff spaces, so it has to be a homeomorphism. Right, so we get, therefore, uh, this is a homeomorphism. All right, so in fact, when x, when your Banach algebra is generated by a single element x, then, uh, then in fact we get that the spectrum of A is homeomorphic to the spectrum of x. So this justifies the terminology. Um, of course, not every, you, not every unital abelian Banach algebra need be generated by a single element, so this is a more general notion. All right, so now let's think about, uh, let's study the spectrum again, a bit, and let's think about our basic example of a unital abelian uh, Banach algebra, even C star algebra, which is continuous bounded functions on topological space. And here we have this uh, theorem of stone, originally due to stone. I want to say in the late 30s at some point, uh, maybe it could have been early 30s, I don't remember. So the theorem of Stone says the following. Uh, it says, so let X be a topological space. So then we have an associated abelian C star algebra, and hence we have its associated spectrum, and we have a map between, so define beta to be the map from x to the spectrum of continuous bounded functions on x given by uh, beta x 
at f is just point evaluation, f at x. So it's clearly a continuous uh, homomorphism, which takes the identity to the identity. Uh, so then, beta is continuous and has dense image. And moreover, if X is compact Hausdorff, then it's a homeomorphism. So then beta is a homeomorphism. So whenever we have uh, CB of X, of X compact house work, this is naturally homeomorphic to X itself. All right, so let's uh, prove this. That should be straightforward with the results we already know. Um, let's see, the first is that, uh, so clearly beta X is a homomorphism, a continuous homomorphism for each x. Uh, so let's show first that beta is continuous. That should be easy enough to do. So if xi converges to x, so if we have some net uh, of xi which converges to x, uh, so then let's look at what is beta xi. Apply it to any f. This is f at xi. But f is a continuous function, hence this converges to f of x, which is beta x of f. So what does this mean? This means that beta xi of f converges to beta x of f, and this is for every single f. That's exactly defining the weak star topology. All right, so we get that therefore beta xi converges to beta x uh, weak star. So that shows that this map beta is continuous. Uh, next we have to show that uh, the image has dense range. So this might take a little bit uh, of work. So we'll have to, this is the heart of the proof. So let's see, why, why is the image, why is the image dense? Um, so of course, yeah, yeah, why is the image dense? So let's go ahead and prove this. So let's suppose, we'll do this by contradiction. So let's suppose we have something which is uh, not in the closure of the image. So suppose we have uh, some thing in the spectrum, but this is not in the closure of the image of this map beta, and we want to reach a contradiction from this. All right, so what do we know about that? Well, since it's not in this, uh, if we take anything that is in this, then it has to have a different kernel from chi. So therefore, if C is in the closure here, uh, we know that the kernel, the kernel of these two things have to be different. So that means that uh, there's some element in the kernel of chi which is not in the kernel of z. So therefore, then, uh, just because, uh, well, we know that both of them, the kernels are maximal ideals, right? So for instance. So therefore, there's, right, you can't even have an inclusion of kernels. So therefore, there's something in the kernel of chi. Let's call that something uh, x sub c. This is in the kernel of chi, but it's not in the kernel of c. So uh, c, x c, it's not equal to uh, But we can also use the fact that uh, if this is not zero, then for some neighborhood of C, this is also not zero, right? It's bounded away because of the weak star topology. 
Right, so we get the therefore. Therefore, there exists some C. This also depends on C. Let's call it greater than zero. Um, uh, such that, and some open neighborhood of C and O C uh, an open neighborhood of C. So this is in uh, the spectrum. So, uh, so this is in the spectrum C X. So weak star open neighborhood uh, such that say C to prime applied to X C an absolute value is greater than C and this is for all C prime in this neighborhood. So that's clear. All right, so that's just using continuity. Uh, but now this is true for, so what have we done? For every C, which is in the closure of beta, uh, we found an open neighborhood of C. So you can imagine now we use compactness. So we've produced an open cover, and now we take a finite subcover. Um, oh. uh, so the open cover, so for each open cover of this set. Yeah, but how do you have a finite subcover? Uh, because this set is compact, of course. Because we already know, I mentioned it earlier, that the spectrum is always a compact set. right? And here we have a closed subset of a compact set. So we didn't explicitly prove that the spectrum is compact, but uh, like I said, it's just equivalent to the fact that a weak star limit of home a weak star uh, limit of uh, homomorphisms is again a homomorphism, which is an obvious obvious fact. All right. So therefore, by compactness, There exists some finite subcover. There exists uh, in such that uh, the closure is contained in the union. Uh, so I guess one ten of these O C I's. All right. So now let's take. C to be the minimum of all these C, C I's. Uh, so I'll give ourselves some room. And then what do we know? We know that therefore, uh, and let's also set Y to be the sum as I goes from one up to N of um, of the absolute value of um, x uh, so x c maybe it's a bit poor terminology I've chosen because I've used x for the topological space but I've chosen my letter x c for uh, a function no? okay maybe I should have this looks maybe too confusing. So let me change the terminology here. Let me change this x to f so it looks more like a function. Hopefully that's a bit clearer looking. All right. So what do we have then? Let's set, now let me also not call it Y, but let me call it G. So G is the sum as I goes from one to N of F C I squared. All right, so then what do we have? We have that therefore, if say 
C naught is anything in the closure of the range of beta, uh, then what do we know? We know that it's in one of these open sets. So that means that that C naught uh, applied to one of these FIs has to be greater than the corresponding thing and hence greater than the minimal thing. So if we sum all of these, so you get the therefore, C naught of G is uh, just the sum of all these things. And uh, C naught, so all of these are just point evaluations. So uh, clearly the absolute value squared is going to be the, you can, right? So we have that this is um, greater than or equal to the, um, uh, well, the claim is since we have a squared here, this will be C squared. Is that clear? So when you plug in G, you get a sum of positive things. So the remark I want to make is, of course, C naught of uh, absolute value of F squared is the absolute value of C naught of F squared. Why is that? That's because C naught has to preserve, uh, this is because we know it's a homomorphism, but also C naught of F bar is C naught of F bar. And this is obvious because this is true for point evaluation and we know that C naught is a limit of point evaluations. Yeah? So therefore we have this equality and therefore when we plug that into the sum we get this equality. Okay. Um, so let's just uh, remark that's where this equality came from. Uh, so what does that mean? So yeah, we always are bounded away from zero uh, when we plug in this function. So this is true for everything in the closure, so in particular it's true for the point evaluations themselves. All right, so we get therefore, if we look at G at any point X, so this is uh, beta X of G, which is greater than or equal to C squared which we already know is greater than zero. So here we have a positive function on the set, which is strictly bounded away from zero. So that means it has a bounded inverse, a bounded continuous inverse. Right? Uh, but what else do we know about this G? We, we have also, uh, where was our original thing? Chi, chi of G. Well, each of these FIs are in the kernel, and the kernel's an ideal, so therefore we get that chi of G is also equal to zero. So here we've just produced an invertible element, which is in the kernel of chi, but that's a contradiction, right? So uh, this gives All right, so that was the difficult part of the proof. So therefore, what do we know? Uh, going back to where we left off, that shows that this beta has dense image. So we show that it's a continuous map. We have its uh, dense image. Now let's suppose that X is compact Hausdorff and, and show that it's a homeomorphism. So now, suppose X is compact and Hausdorff. Uh, so in this case, well, we already know that the image is uh, compact itself and is dense, so it has to be surjective. And we already know, uh, oh, we don't know that it's uh, bijective. So then beta is surjective. So to see that it's a homeomorphism, it's enough just to show that it's injective, right? But now what does it mean to be uh, injective? To be injective just means that if you have two points in X, then there's some continuous bounded function which gives different values at that point. But that's exactly uh, uh, Eurozone's lemma, for instance. So by uh, Eurozone's lemma, uh, beta is injective.
All right, so we get a bijection then, uh, and therefore it's a homeomorph, the continuous bijection is a homeomorphism between compact jaw store spaces. All right, uh, let me also remark another thing which follows uh, easily from this. So, uh, so here's maybe the definition, which maybe many of you have seen before, and that is that this spectrum uh, is the uh, stone check compactification. Uh, stone, oh, that doesn't look right. Uh, I think the, that looks better. Stone check compactification. Uh, of X. To be a bit more precise, uh, the stone check, check compactification is not topological space, but rather the topological space together with this continuous map. So really I should say uh, it's not quite this, but it's actually uh, the map, the continuous map that we obtain here. But uh, a lot of times you just talk about the space itself being the stone check magnification. Uh, and it has the universal property. So universal property that if we have any homomorphism from x to k where a continuous a continuous um, uh, homomorphism where k is compact in Hausdorff So then, there exists a unique continuous homomorphism, let's call it beta pi, from uh, this stone check compactification. To k, such that uh, beta pi, if we look at what beta pi does to point evaluation beta x, this is exactly beta, uh, what's well, exactly pi, pi x for all uh, x and x. So this is a universal property of the stone check magnification. And I'll leave it to you guys to verify that this is indeed the case. It's uh, just, you just define things and then you chase some diagrams. It's really a trivial thing. Uh, so this is how Stone proved the existence of the Stone check compactification. Uh, so check and the same year as Stone uh, proved it a different way by just uh, defining, uh, well, once you know that this space exists, you, the universal property tells you it's unique. Um, and so check defined, uh, he just looked at the inverse image of all maps into compact house door spaces and uh, interesting, it's called the stone check compactification, but in both stone and checks papers, if you look, they both say that this is, um, uh, this is already known by Tikhonov. So uh, maybe it should be the Tikhonov compactification. I don't know. They both, they both attribute the result um, to an earlier paper of Tikhonov. I'm also, uh, I'm not really sure why it's called the stone check compactification, but if you're in Hungary, they call it the check stone compactification, so. I'm confused why it's called check instead of catch. Uh, that, I don't know. He's, he's Hungarian, so I'm not the person to ask. You need to find a Hungarian. I just found out the other day, uh, Mozart's middle name is not Amadeus. It's Theophilus, but Theophilus translates to Amadeus. So I don't know why, why do we translate his middle name? All right, so that's uh, Stone's theorem and the existence of the Stone check compactification. A very useful topological space to keep in mind. Uh, one corollary of this, um, 
one corollary of, of existence of this is also easy to see that um, uh, you can tell exactly when the image here will be a G delta subset and you can completely characterize which topological spaces are G delta subsets of compact Hausdorff spaces and there's some, some easy things you can do with this space. So it's a nice space. All right. So now let's uh, go back to an abstract abelian. So in particular, what did we see? So that was the corollary I wanted to see of all of this. So the corollary is that if uh, X and Y are compact Hausdorff spaces, So then, the continuous, now we don't need to write bounded since they're compact, continuous functions. So this C-star algebra is isomorphic to this C-star algebra if and only if X is homeomorphic to Y. In fact, much more than that, uh, even that the map you get here has to come from the corresponding map here. And in general, we see if you have any, homo, any homomorphism here, that gives you a star homomorphism up here, and you get a whole uh, um, a functor from the category of, of compact Hausdorff spaces to the category of continuous functions uh, up here. All right, so, um, so we get that as a correlate. But now we have the question is, what about if we have abstract an abstract abelian unital C star algebra, uh, what can we say? And there the theorem of Gelfond is in fact that every abstract unital C star algebra has to be of this form. So these are the only ones in fact. Abelian. Abelian. So uh, here's a definition. So let's suppose if A is a unital Banach abelian Banach algebra. So the Gelfand transform is the map gamma, which maps. Um, a into continuous uh, functions on the spectrum of A, uh, which is given by gamma A at chi is chi of A. All right, so that's the Gelfan transform. Uh, and then uh, the main theorem due to Gelfand. So up here, Stone's theorem, if we have a homeomorphism between the uh, compact Hausdorff spaces and they give us homeomorphisms up here, Gelfand's is kind of the dual to that. If we have homeomorphisms from abelian uh, C-star algebras, then we come back and we get a compact Hausdorff space uh, right here. So the theorem of Gelfand is that if A is a unital C star algebra, so then the Gelfand transform uh, is a uh, star isomorphism between these two C star algebras. So in fact, every unital abelian C star algebra is just continuous functions on a compact Hausdorff space, specifically its, its spectrum. Um, uh, okay, I don't think we have time to, to do this, so we'll finish this on Monday.